Hi, Rachel. Can you see me? On my screen, the little box that looks like it's just my head. Is that yeah. You is there any? Maybe you can just move the. I can see you, but I mean, you yeah. maybe if you can move the camera down a little bit, but it doesn't yeah, matter. Tried, we yeah. See well, we're oh, doing, are we doing perfect. sound only, or are we doing video? No, too? we're doing video also. Okay. Well. Okay. That's okay. You, I can okay. see you. You're the class, the classic talking head, I guess. <laughs> well, welcome. I thank you. Uh, this is really an honor for me, and uh, I really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Um, oh. I can't tell you how special this is for me because, you know, I think seventy-eight degrees of wisdom is probably the most significant book, uh, among many of your other books uh, for me uh, in tarot because it really got me interested uh, in tarot <laughs> in the very beginning. Thank you. Know, you. It sort of. It, you know, the stories and, and, and just your knowledge is just so impressive uh, to me, but uh, I thank you so much for coming on. So what's yeah, new well, with you? Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. What's new with hey. you? Uh, anything uh, interesting going on? A, you know, it seems like I have loads of things going on and they're all a little bit up in the air. Um, I'm actually writing a memoir though. I publish it. I want to call it that. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I understand that because the word memoir is kind of artsy, you know, and yes. I don't care for it. But, um, but basically, it's about my life in tarot storytelling and magic. Well, wow. so, well, a lot of stuff in it, and uh, interesting. So I'm very excited about it. And it's the kind of thing where once you start thinking about it, it's like, wow, oh yeah, there's that. Oh, oh, look at that, you know. And then I, yes. I do readings about things that happened to me, uh, readings about dreams I had, and the readings are just astonishing. It, it's it's a it's very You're exciting. So it's very early stages, but it's a very exciting project. You're such a great storyteller too. You know, it's it's just it's one of my favorite things about you is reading all the little stories. Uh, Thank and you. Yeah. And so. Yeah. Well, that's you know that's my first love is storytelling always. You know. Absolutely. And which is interesting because it's like in the tarot world, to me the tarot is all about storytelling, but a yes. lot of people don't see it that way. You know, they see it as making hard and fast predictions, or they see yeah. it as about um, kind of connections to occult diagrams, and all sorts of things. Sure. Yeah, but, but yeah. to me, it's always about the pictures or stories, you know? Yes, absolutely. So I'm doing that. And then I'm also doing an interesting um, short thing. Is, uh, I don't know if, do you know who Leonora Carrington was? Surrealist artist and storyteller? I've, I've, the name sounds vaguely familiar to yeah, me. She was one of the great surrealist artists. And, okay. um, and it was discovered not long ago, apparently, that before her death, she did a set of tarot cards. Yes. And so a publisher has gotten um, you know, the rights to produce them. And they're doing this gorgeous production, and they asked me to do an article about it. So I get to write about um, Leonora Carrington's tarot cards. Interesting. Which it sounds wonderful. fascinating. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Old. And I'm doing a novella about a girl who gets a magical fountain pen in the mail. Well. Yeah, all sorts of stuff going on. <laughs> Very interesting. And I know yeah. that you just finished the book for uh, Crystal Skull, right? Or the, uh, the, the yeah, the Crystal yes, Skull yeah, Tarot. Yeah, so yeah. we're Have all very excited about that. Kind of thing. I did the Brady Tarot. I don't know if you know about that. I have that, yes, and it's I love spectacular it. Spectacular deck, I, really. I love it, yes. So. Yeah, really wonderful deck. And uh, and I did, I was supposed to do a deck called the, a group of people who did coloring books. And the coloring books are called Beauty of Horror. And they're kind of tongue-in-cheek sort of horror scenes with characters from standard horror kind of movies and stuff. Yeah. And I did a tarot deck, so I did the book for that, you know. And yeah. then um, I met Jesse Driscoll, who did the Crystal Skull Tarot. And Love Jesse. We got, we got connected, and I just said, okay, I'll do the book for that. And, and, and that turned out to be a bigger project than they thought because the deck has got so many levels and so many dimensions. It's really That's so exciting, deck. though, because I backed that deck on Kickstarter, and I just can't wait to get it. <laughs> Me too. I, you know, I have a I'm sample, of course. I have my, you know, what I used, you know, my, but it's not, I haven't, nobody's seen the final version yet as far as I know. Right. Right. Well, we're all very excited for that. I got to tell yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I know. So for so, the, you know, I have a, a couple of questions for you. And, um, you know, for the first question, I thought, you, I'm reading uh, Forest of uh, Souls right now. And, and oh, you know, you talk, you talk quite a bit about using the cards to develop questions. You know, so yeah. for, the, for the first question, that's what I thought I would do. I would, I would uh, come up with a question based on uh, cards. Okay, so, I drew, yeah. so I drew three cards last night, and I'm using the uh, Spiral Which Tarot. Definitely... This is the okay. Spiral Tarot. Yeah, it's, it's just one I've been using, and it was the first one oh, that was you like – No, I haven't looked at that yet. I think I have. That's, that's, that's the Australian one, right? 
Yeah, uh, uh, Case Devington. Yes, she. I believe she is Australian. Yeah, I got yes. it years and years ago. I haven't looked at it in a long time. I yeah. know. I that's what happened with me. I sort of just pulled it out. I was like, you know, I I really love this deck, and I haven't used it in so long, and I just kind of reached for it. I don't know. It was very instinctual, Good. but yeah. Nice. Um, and so I have a reverse card here, and and the thing for me with reversals is I don't typically. Uh, I don't intentionally turn cards around. I only read reversals when they happen. And it yeah, just so sure. happened after I pulled the three that this was the only card in the deck that was reversed. Yeah, me too. That's, that's my attitude too. So but when I do a reading for someone, I give them all the cards right side up. And if they shuffle them in a way that some are reversed, then we do reverse cards. And if not, we don't, you know. Interesting. That's, that's a pretty good idea. Um, so I got the Emperor reverse. I figure you could talk you know, about the question, but also the cards as well. It's kind of okay. like a, uh, so we have the emperor reversed here. Yeah. Uh, I got the ace of wands mm -hmm. and I got the five of swords. So I thought. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, go on. Well, I looked at it at first and I was like, you know, how can I get a question from this? You know, and then it just came to me. It just was so obvious to me. I, you know, the emperor reversed, and this is sort of like playing the piano for Elton John. You know, I, I feel like I'm, <laughs> I feel like, I feel like that right now. But uh, the emperor reversed is for me, you know, uh, you're a rule breaker. You're someone who so went against, too. yeah, went against the grain, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, you sort of, you went against the old uh, sort of occultists and you developed, you know, what you, what you refer to in uh, Forest of, uh, Forest of Souls as like a, a, a tarot jazz musician, you know. I really love that <laughs> that term. I forgot that. <laughs> I think it's perfect, you know, because I, I love music and it just makes so much sense to me. You know, um, I, I wouldn't say so much I went against the old occultists, and I just went in a different direction. Right. Exactly. I did not make those structures and those diagrams and correspondences and all everything else the main focus of you know yes. my work. So then, of yeah, course, I was thinking about too about rule breaking for the emperor reverse, definitely. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, th that's encouraging. <laughs> and uh, so then I have the ace of wands, which is mm -hmm. uh, the card in the middle, and I thought inspiration. So okay. I thought, you know, w so what inspired you to go in that direction? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, then, of course, we have the five of swords. So, and what were some of the challenges that you uh, okay, I was experienced? Okay, I think that was the odd one out. I thought the emperor reverse. I, I agree with you, breaking all the rules, you know, okay, or ignoring them. And then the way some ones, I thought was this was the fresh, inspired, the fresh direction, you know. Right. Um, then the five of swords it was yes, challenges. Okay, yeah, what? Yeah, okay. So, so what inspired me? Well, you know, I, I came into tarot with no knowledge of it. Um, Someone read my tarot cards in exchange for giving her a ride home. And so I just I'd never heard of them. Well, I heard of them through literature, primarily through The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, because I was an English major and an English teacher. Gotcha. Um, and so that, and then also I'd read this book from Ritual to Romance, in which uh, they made the claim that the tarot came from the Grail myths, which isn't true, but it was a good story at the time. Yeah. And um, so that was my knowledge of tarot. It was very literary and very storytelling. And um, so this woman said she read my tarot cards. So she read my tarot cards. And I don't remember the reading, but I was totally taken with the deck. It's really the most wonderful thing. I just was so fascinated by it. And she used Eden Gray's book, like so many of us did, and I did when I started. And um, so she put down a card, and she'd look it up in the book. And the cards were mysterious, and the book was also mysterious. The book pretended to um, explain things, but it really didn't. It just it was more mysterious, which was, I liked. I thought that was just great, yeah. you know? Um, and so that started me. And uh, I just, you know, I got the cards. I had a search for them because it was before they were popular. Just about like years, a year or so before they you know, were published by U.S. Games and made a big splash. They were very hard to find. Anyway, I just started going through the cards one by one, doing readings for my friends, you know, using Eden's book and so on. And I just kept seeing stories open up in them and connecting to other things that were not in the cards particularly, that were not necessarily designed to be in the cards, but made a lot of sense to me. The one that really took off with this was the Ten of Pentacles in the Rider deck. Um, because as well as showing the family inside the um, archway, and they're all looking kind of tense and they're not really communicating, you know, and the little kids holding on to mommy, but looking away as if he doesn't really want to be there and so on. And as well as all that, there was this mysterious old bearded, white, white bearded old man outside the gate. We kind of coat him many colors, you know. Yeah. Um, 
And I connected that in my mind with Odysseus. Also, because in the picture, no, none of the people notice he's there at all, but the dogs do. You know? yeah. uh, the animal instinct sees something that the human conscious can't see. And then in, in the Odyssey, Odysseus returns home, and because his house has been occupied by this invading army of suitors, um, he, uh, Athena disguises him as an old beggar. You know? So he's an old white-haired beggar, just like the guy in the Ten of Pentacles card. And the only creature who recognizes him um, is his dog. Yeah. And it's a beautiful scene. The dog, dog has been like old, dogs, you know, he left 20 years ago, right? So the dog is super, super old, you know? And he's kind of just, can hardly move. He just lies there all day, you know? And then Odysseus comes and sits down and the dog like looks up, you know, and he sits up and he kind of staggers over to him and then he falls down dead. Wow. He was able to greet his master and now, now he can die. It was a beautiful yeah. scene, you know? So to me, <laughs> that showed me that there can be scenes in the picture that, the books I never describe, and that probably the artists didn't particularly think about. Yeah. And it's something I know about. As, as a writer, um, you often do things you're not conscious of. In this book I'm, gonna, I'm doing, this sort of memoir kind of book, I'm going to be writing about that. You know, the thing is that anybody reading it, if they make that connection, oh, well, of course this was intended. It's so, you know, detailed. Yeah. But no, it's just unconscious. And, yeah, and I, I mean, Yeah, and I saw some stuff in Jesse's Crystal Skull card that were like that, you know? Sure. Um, and she was amazed that she didn't realize what she had done. Yeah. One or two things, you know? Yep. So that, that was that direction. Sure. And that was, my, that was my ace of wands, too, my inspiration to do it in my own way. Plus, you know, I have four plans to live, including the sun and rising sign. And so I'm just an individualist. It's, it's you know. That's really I'm not really an astrologer. It's, it's a wonderful old joke that so characterizes Leo. It's instead um, this cartoon, which this person is saying, um, us Leos don't believe in all that astrology nonsense. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't know that you were a Leo. You you are a Leo or? Leo sign, Leo rising sign, Leo Mercury, and Leo Pluto. That makes sense. My partner's a Leo. I, uh -huh. I actually get along very well with Leos usually. I'm a yeah, Pisces. Good. I'm a Pisces sun and moon, and I believe oh. Scorpio rising. Uh-huh. Um, okay. But, uh, yeah, Stephen is a, is a – my partner, Stephen, is a Leo uh, through and through. He's, you mm. know, very much yeah. – that way. And yeah. my partner years ago was a Pisces and um, it was a complicated thing. It was, it was a great connection actually. Some of them went well together, but you know, they're always Isn't it funny? It's always fire and water. I feel like fire and water, you know, that's true. That's supposed to match, but they do, don't they? Yes. That's interesting. <laughs> good, like, so it's like fire and water, but yes, fire and water can be great. So what's your partner's birthday? Uh, August 2nd. He's, okay. I'm the 17th. The oh, wow. Okay. Very cool. So you're later in the month. And one of the things I write about, in this book is how I really came to notice that everything in my life is a piece. So for example, on my birthday is 17-8-1945. And if you add those numbers up, you get 17-8. Well, you that's know, crazy. And, isn't that crazy? Yeah. Uh, yes, it yeah. is. It's very, yeah. very inter interesting. Yeah. And you, you seem to really love numerology and you really sparked that interest in me. Uh, oh, good. Uh, you, you sent me down sort of a rabbit hole with numerology uh, uh -huh. a while back. Hmm. And uh, I've read, um, the, I believe, the Pythagorean Tarot, which you mentioned in your book, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, Tarot Wisdom, which which was cool. But he recommended a book, which I loved, um, in his book. Uh, it's called The Mystery of Numbers by Amory Schimmel. Have you ever come across that book? I don't think so. I have a good friend who's a numerologist and tarotist, and she would know it. Well, this book is, today. This is uh, all about the archetypes of of numbers themselves she goes through every culture every it's it's it, oh, that's it's, cool yeah that's it's different. really yeah. great yeah i came across her in college uh in a college course way back uh on a book on islam sufi islam okay and so i was familiar with her but then when i read this book uh the mystery of numbers i was it's it's one of my favorite books of good that's wonderful time, uh, I'm really happy to on, that, yeah. numbers i really like that idea of going across culturally because my experience is that most numerology uh, works, they tend to be one particular tradition. Yes. Pythagorean or, or Kabbalah or, you know, sacred geometry. Yes. Um, and so it's nice to know that someone does a cross-cultural version. I think yeah, really yeah. I, I think she, what she was trying to do was just like capture, I guess, the archetypes themselves of the numbers. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but that was the biggest challenge that I had for learning numerology and applying it to say like pip, pip card reading yeah. was that every book I picked up had a different approach. Yeah. So it was like, you know what I mean? And 
but uh, you you gave me some advice way back. I, I sent you an email and you said that you know these are arbitrary things, and uh, you know you sort of set me straight on that. And, and yeah. that was very good advice. You know. Thank you. Um, yeah, good. So uh, for the next There's question, five of, but the five of swords though. Um, oh yeah. You know, I'm trying to think of how I've had defeats. You know, it's like nothing gigantic. I mean, my life certainly has had defeats, like everybody's life. You know. Sure. Things that didn't work out one way or another. But in my tarot work, I don't, you know, I, I, where I've had defeats, I guess, have been somewhat in my fiction writing, in which my fiction was really taking off, and then it's just uh, kind of dried up. And I won a couple of awards, and the second one was this really important award called the World Fantasy Award. And when I won the award, the book I won it for was out of print. And my agent could never get a reprint, could never get a paperback. Wow. You know, and then I just, they didn't sell enough. And, uh, but the yeah. tarot books have, all, my, you know, work in tarot has always worked out really nicely. And yeah. Good. Connect. I thought the community welcomed me and I really, I'm greatly, you know, great, great gratitude for that. Sure. Uh, yeah. One thing I do want to do is read more of your fiction. I actually have Godmother Night here, which is uh, on my list. That was the book that won the award. Read. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, I definitely want to read that. Um, and I do have Tower of Perfection behind I me, which that, I, yes. I read the intro, uh, but I've been reading Forest of Souls. So once I finish up with Forest of Souls, okay. I'm going to um, pick one of the two. <laughs> yeah. The last two stories, Tower of Perfection, to some extent the first story, I combined them into a novel called The Child Eater, which if you read that one, you might be interested in taking a look at. Absolutely. I sure will. Uh, so uh, speaking of authors, I have um, Stephen Bright. Um, uh, so mm. he's your fellow author and uh, yeah, deck yeah. creator. He, yeah. uh, I sort of, in order to sort of survey my audience, people who watch my channel and people I'm friendly with, I reached out to people in the community and I, I gathered a few questions. So I got one from Stephen. Okay. And he asks, are there any opinions or beliefs that you held about tarot and its practice in the early days uh, that you have since changed your mind about uh, through experience? You know, well, not just through experience, but also through um, research. Sure. It's not done by me, but by other people. Yeah, you know, the, I know there's several, but I don't, nothing comes right to mind. Um, <laughs> let me try to think about that. Um, well, one was that, um, that playing cards descended from tarot. Uh, the tarot cards, the original cards, and playing cards come out, then that was wrong. It's the other way around. Um, not, to, not by much. Um, playing cards came into Europe and like the uh, late 1300s and the tarot um, originated in like, you know, first half of the 1400s. So not, not by much, but right. definitely playing cards came first. I also thought the Joker was a descendant of the fool card. Yes, I saw that. Certainly similarities, but in fact, it turns out that uh, as far as known historically, it was independently invented by a group of men in a gentleman's club who wanted their... Um, their card games have more spice, their poker game. Yeah. So they invented a wild card. So, so like I say, so, you know. Um, Some might say that's the sort archetype of, sort, of, sort of revealing itself, you know what I mean? Just sort of like true, yeah. an unconscious thing. Um, and it's also possible that, in fact, those, those people did know the tarot deck. Because, you know, tarot was a game played by sure. people competitively, too. But so, that, so certain things like that. Um, and other kinds of ideas, you know, where it came from and, you know, its origins. Some of those ideas have certainly changed over time. Oh, here's another one. Like, yeah, so the idea that the tarot was originally a spiritual structure and then it got used as a game, um, that, you know, or fortune telling was very early. It's not, the game was around for a long time before either the occult interpretation or as far as, you know, fortune telling. Mary Greer makes the point that everything else like, was like that was used for fortune telling. Why wouldn't tarot cards be? There's no evidence that tarot cards were used for fortune telling, no historical record until the uh, late, um, I guess, uh, yeah, late 18th, early 19th century. And there's no record of it being seen as a spiritual teaching until 1781, when it was announced as such in an article by a French uh, um, historian named Antoine Cord de Chapelin. Yeah, they, they get blown. Yeah. So some of those things, they definitely have changed over time. Was that the La Prim Primitive or... Pr uh, the Mont Primitive, the primitive, the primitive world, world, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That's so fascinating. 
Um, and so uh, sort of in that realm, I have Simon from the Hermit's Cave. He asks, uh, because you discovered Tarot in the 1970s, what do you think of the direction that Tarot is go- sort of going into now uh, with all the many decks and, and mm. so forth? I love it. I, to me, it's like a great renaissance, you know, all these decks. And, and you know, it's kind of interesting. Like people kept saying, you know, well, the computer is going to do everything with Tarot. Everything will be online, you know. And that hasn't happened because people really want to be able to shuffle cards and not just click a button, you know. But where the computer world has tremendously influenced tarot is the possibility of um, Kickstarter decks. Yes. So if you no need to sell it to a publisher who will have to make sell 50,000 copies right. or something like that to make a profit, and therefore it has to be safe, you know? Yes. You can, if you get enough people to back your vision, you just do it, you know? Right. And this has been this wonderful, exciting development, I think. It really in the tarot is. World. And like Bob Place and I have been doing things together. You know, we did the Burning Serpent Oracle and we did the Raziel Tarot. And I both of those right we could not have done if a publisher had to pay for it because, you know, they would have had to, they would have had to be not dumbed down, but made more accessible to the widest possible audience, making it more traditional tarot, so on and so on. Yes. You know, so having to do it, being able to do it ourselves, it was just liberated us to do what we wanted. Did now was that on Kickstarter? Um, the uh, Indiegogo, which Bob prefers. Oh, okay. I wish yeah, I would have known that was Bob's been doing these things for years, actually. Um, I don't know what, but pretty early on, he switched to publishing all his own stuff. Yeah. Because uh, he's an artist and he knows how to format things and all yes. that kind of stuff. So, uh, but he uses Indiegogo. He just finds that the system's a bit better for him to Kickstarter. Well, that's good to know because you know yeah. I love his text and I didn't know yeah. he was doing that. Uh, so I'll have go to, to keep an eye out. Um, his website, you know, he's got so many wonderful things. Oh yeah, I've I've ordered quite a few decks from him, um, and I do I do love him as a creator. I got to get his book though, his one sort of general book on um, sort of everything, his um, alchemical tarot and the uh, sevenfolds mm-hmm. mystery. You know. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I'm definitely very fascinated by that. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was a very interesting deck that you created, the Raziel Tarot. Um, mm-hmm. I was I was real I really loved the little book. Uh, that you wrote mm, and the art is just so beautiful and it's uh, one of the few majors only decks that I have I have mm-hmm. just a few but I really really love it and um, mm. taught me a lot you know mm-hmm. good good yeah we, you know we're hoping to do a full deck and um, be playing with a full deck as the saying goes oh but it's you know it's, it's a lot of work and uh, we're not exactly sure kind of exactly how we want to organize the pictures yes you know because, you know, Bob works in a certain way and I'm interested in the story. So we have to find a way to coordinate sure. these kind of things. But we're hoping to do it because it's such an exciting Oh, that would be so yeah. exciting. Yeah. I would love that. I, I love the deck and I always thought, well, wow, if this was a full deck, it would probably be one of my, my most used tarots. Mm. I just yeah. love the biblical stories. I've always loved uh, mm-hmm. stories from the Bible um, since mm-hmm. I was a kid. And I still find them fascinating. I'm not very religious, but I like the stories, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Since I was a kid. And yeah. I, um, you know, when people heard it was a Jewish deck, they thought that meant it was a Kab- Kabbalah deck. But Kabbalah and tarot is not Jewish. It's called Western Kabbalah. It's a cult, you know? Yes. There's a whole derivation. It goes Jewish Kabbalah, and then it was Christian Kabbalah, and then Western Kabbalah, which is far beyond Christian, came out of Christian Kabbalah. But, um, but it's, I keep so always saying to you, no, it's not. It's not a system. It's stories. Right. You know? And the stories drive the whole thing, you know? Yeah, it's, and it's basic, fascinating. I love it. The basic stories are Moses and also the Shekinah. The yes. female aspect of God. That's I love that. I really aspect. love that idea of the, of the Shekinah. I really love yeah. that. I think that that's, that's perfect, you know? Yeah, that's probably, the most, that's probably the most driving energy of the deck. And, you know, she appears in quite a few cards. She's, in, she's a high priestess. She's justice. Um, she's... Uh, in both judgment and the world, um, and she's even in death, you know, taking Moses' soul peacefully. Yes. Fascinating. I love it. <laughs> so um, I have uh, just a few more questions here. I have Chris uh, from Elemental uh, Cardamancy. Uh, it's the name of his channel. He writes, uh, if you could teach just one thing about how to be a great tarot reader, what would it be? Well, I always say two things. That, that, there's two slogans I feel underlie everything. The first is pay attention. You know, just see what happens. Really look at the cards. Really um, don't come in with 
you know, just ordinary, or, I'm sorry, automatic responses. Don't memorize everything and think you know everything because you memorized everything. Just pay attention to what comes up, you know, really, as I put it, see what there is to see, you know, and then be able to communicate that. So I think that's really, really important, you know, to always have a fresh eye to see what's going on right now and not, oh, yes, this card means that, and then just plug it in. So that, I think that's very important. And the other is the slogan. I don't know. I sometimes feel like I'm quoting it from someplace, but I don't know. It's, it's what you love loves you. So if you love the tarot, we'll love you back. Yes. I don't, agree with that a hundred percent. Good. It's, yeah. Yeah. So true. So this is, I mean, those are, so it's not, you know, a particular thing of like study this and don't study that. It's really a general approach to how to, because the tarot to me is a living being and you want to approach it like that. You want to recognize what it gives to you and give, give things back to yourself. You want to have like a relationship, a love relationship with the deck, it seems to me. I agree with that. I, <laughs> That's so amazing. I think you're a hundred percent right on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, let's see, we have uh, another question from Masha uh, from Musings with Masha. So mm -hmm. what are your views on combining tarot with uh, the supplementary layers, disciplines such as astrology, Kabbalah, chakras, colors, uh, and how do you do it in shorter readings? If you, if you do do it? Well, I, I don't do too much of that. Um, I do a bit of Kabbalah with it but I'll get to that in a second. But my, to me, the challenge always is, so once you know that the um, emperor card is Aries, well, what does that get you? Right. You know, and I just, to me, it's, it's too easy to just say this equals this equals this. Yes. And I feel I have to get to the underlying sense of what that's about. Sometimes it works for me, sometimes it doesn't. So I, you know, I've often asked people actually, you know, people who do a lot of astrology and tarot, say, well, what does it do for you? And often what it's, it seems to be the astrologers first. And then the tarot card is linking them to stuff they already understand. Yes. So they can apply their understanding of Aries to the card and so on, you know? Um, so, but to me, it, it has to be something of meaning and story. Sure. You know? So, yeah, so I could, I could still do the story approach that, you know, the emperor is like he is because he's Aries and how does that feed him and how does that hurt him and stuff like that. And a lot of people do it that way and that's really wonderful, you know. Yeah. Um, so the thing I've been doing lately that's a second discipline is um, making a tree of life of people's birth cards. This is not my invention. I learned about it from a wonderful, brilliant um, Israeli taoist named David Shar, who, with whom I taught in China a couple of times. And then uh, David um, learned it. It was first came up with, uh, by um, Wald Amerson, New York Tarot School. And so David learned it from Wald. And um, are you there? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm here. I'm just listening. Uh, you yes. moving, so I wasn't sure. No, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry about that. Sometimes, sometimes connection freezes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Anyway. I'm just I'm very listening very much. Yeah. So what that is, this is so thank you. Know, I'm sure you know about birth cards, you know? Yes. Um, so, um, so there's two schools. This. The first is Angelique Zarian. And Mary Greer is the person who most developed that in her great book, uh, Tarot Constellations, and her work over the decades, really. And in that, you have, um, you just have two cards. You know, for me, they're 17, 8, right? And these are like, um, and these are like the soul and personality. So I think the higher number, the, as far as, no, the lower number, I think, is my soul card. So my soul is an 8 throughout many lifetimes, you know? Yes. But then in this lifetime, I'm a 17. Um, but you know, if I think about it for a second, I should ask Mary about this because it's been a long time since we discussed it. Uh, if your soul is an eight, then isn't your personality always a seventeen? Because what other higher number reduces to eight? I never thought about that before. But anyway, but but the, the point is, um, so this gives you a guidance to how you approach things, you know. And then, um, and then Wall's idea though is. That eight and seventeen, like all two pairs like that, have eight cards be eight numbers between them. So you can do a tree of life, which the top the catcher, the top place in the tree of life, is your lower numbered card. And then Malkut, the outer world in the bottom place of the tree of life, is a higher number. So my catcher is the strength, and my outer world is the star. So for years and years I thought, well, this is really great, you know. It's strength and star, what a wonderful combination, you know. I mean, I'm strong and my world is the happy star. And then David 
pointed out to me, you need to look at the cards in between. And that like hit me like a, I don't know, thunderbolt. Because then you saw that the center of the, when he said, he said, you know the center of your card, is, the center of your tree is death. And I was really stunned by this, you know, and it's true. There it is, you know. Yeah, I've he seen actually, that. Yeah. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. He meant, he meant something else by that, but I won't go into that. But, um, but um, there it was, though, you know. And then if my bottom card, my Malkut, is the star, well, that means that Yeso, the card right above it, is the tower. So, and then I said, yes, this is so true in my life that uh, my life gets, like, caught up and, and tight, you know. And something blasts and open. It's very painful. It's very disturbing. But then I'm free, like the star. The world is free again. It just, yes. it just so I'll get it again. This was true. So I've been doing that with clients sometimes. If they're the type that want an overall spiritual sense of their lives, I'll do that. If they just want like information, I won't, you know. So there's that. I do that with people sometimes, you know. Well, that's that's great. And I'm I'm actually just recently got um your uh, the new tarot handbook, like just sort of something to read at the gym. Uh-huh. I read it when I'm on the elliptical a lot of times. Sure. And I just yeah. and I love your little spreads and 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 everything. But I noticed mm-hmm. that you talk quite a bit about uh you know, the cards sort of in sequence and the relationships uh, between the different cards. Yeah. Is that something that's more recent or it's been a while since I read 78 degrees of wisdom, but what you were, you were saying about um, the system you just mentioned about the, uh, you know, your chart, for instance, the cards in between. Um, well, you know, that particular thing is fairly new, but in general, you know, I tend to look at how cards connect to each other. You know, yeah, so I look at things like um, you know, if you put the 20, if you do the full and then 21 cards, you get three rows of seven, but you also get seven vertical rows. So that was something I've done fairly recently. I'm not sure if it's in that book or not, but it's like, so, and each vertical row, what's fascinating is the middle card, the top card and the bottom card are opposites where the, there's like energy tension yes. and the middle card resolves it. So magician, strength, devil. So yes. the magician and the devil are really opposites, you know, Positive, life-giving magic, dark, you know, confining magic. And strength holds both energies. Yes. You know? And then you have in the second, you have um, the empress on top and the tower on the bottom. And in between is the wheel of fortune. So the empress, I'm sorry, the, the high priestess, I'm sorry. You know? So the high priestess is very deep contained energy. Everything is held inside. All the mystery is held inside. The tower blasts everything open. You know? In between is the hermit. The hermit's able to hold both energies. That is such a great way to like. It's it's so to, wonderful to learn. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, I just came up with that a while ago. Other people do it too, I'm sure, but I, I came up with it by myself, and I found it really valuable. You know, the um, the so the three the three groups of seven cards was that something that you came up with, uh, or was it? Uh, oh. not, not not like in general, the three groups of seven yeah, um, it's, vertical it's lines. It's okay. Both. Horizontal lines, you mean? Yeah. Horizontal, yes. Yeah, I came up with totally independently. <laughs> sorry. Um, I, totally independently, I knew that seven was a very important number, and three was an important number, and stuff like that. Um, so totally, on my own, I did that. Then I found out that, in fact, it was something that's been done by others. It was a standard kind of idea among certain occult yeah. teachings. So I just, you know, this happens a lot. Like, if you're self-taught in some way, and to me, the cards are my teacher, not any any books or any truth, the cards themselves teach me all the time. And that's what they taught me. So, and they, that mimics or was the same idea as other people had things have said before me. Yeah, that's so interesting. I remember uh, there's a book uh, by Sally Nichols called The Young in the Tarot. Have you read that Young book? The Tarot. You know, I, this is very interesting. I, I did. And when I read it, I thought, no, wait a minute. There's so much like 78 Degrees of Wisdom. Oh, my God. I'm going like, to check, oh. check when she publishes to see if she stole from me. But in fact, it came out the same year. It did. So two of us came up with the same exact idea. I was. I love that. It's my second favorite tarot book. I, I love that book, but yours is, of course, my first favorite, Rachel. But, <laughs> but <laughs> thank you. But I, when I read that book, I was like, I just wonder, like, if she was reading Rachel's books or what. So I'm, I'm really happy. Isn't that uh, interesting? To, to yeah, I was that. relieved yeah. to find that. You know, she couldn't have because she was writing her book when mine wasn't published yet. You know. Oh, because that would have been so awkward. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would have been, yeah, because then, you know, it would have been complicated and I would have, would I have had to like confront her and she, she, you know, refused to acknowledge. I mean, it was, you know, so I'm so happy that there was not a question at all. It was completely not a question because she was doing this totally independently of me. That's really great. Yeah. 
it's almost like the the it's like you know it's very true it's like something that sort of manifests itself from the cards it's like a, it's like a teaching you know what i mean that sort of just happens uh sort of um reveals itself to different people you know yes that's true yeah yeah that famous you know, the famous thing when um when the student is ready the teacher appears and the teacher is a tarot it's the same thing wow that's when that's we're so ready for it then the tarot reveals itself to us you know Absolutely. Um, but I also I also learned that um, when the teacher is ready, the students appear. So if you want to teach, and nobody's asking you to teach, probably you're not ready. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's actually like be like just one or two people saying, "Would you teach me what you know about tarot?" And then you know you're ready because people want you to teach. You know. Absolutely. Sure. Uh, so we have uh, Mendy from the Artistry of Tarot. She wants to know about uh, formulating questions. Uh, she says, what advice would you give on formulating questions? Uh, she has trouble uh, sort of um, formulating the right questions in a tarot reading. Well, I'm going to give her a really simple answer. Don't. Just write down whatever the client says. If the client says, um, what will I find my soulmate? Write down, what will I find my soulmate? If the client then says, um, well, I was in a relationship and it broke up three years ago, broke up three years ago. You know, and those are the cards, you pick cards for her statements. Yeah. I've been doing this for quite some years now and it's really wonderful. I, you know, with, I, they have people come off and I'll start with a Celtic cross and then switch into their statements. If the statements are full enough and many, I will just do that, you know? Yeah. I actually had a, uh, I did a reading last night and it was very, it was a very difficult reading because it was a reading about uh, uh, their, their partner passed away uh, mm. whilst, while they were together and she sort of blames herself. Um, and it's, it was a very difficult reading for me to do because it's yeah. sort of like a lot of questions about, you know, is he okay? You know, is, yeah, yeah. and it's, it's someone who I'm close with. So, you know, I'm just sort of reading for a friend. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I definitely did it the same exact way. I started off with a Celtic cross because she didn't really have a question. And then I mm -hmm. did the three cards per question. But it was yeah. one of the most challenging readings that I've ever had to do. Yeah. You know, you asked me about um, other things I've, where I've changed my mind or do things differently. And that's one of them, uh, questions. So I used to be one of the people in the camp that said, you know, certain questions are not very productive and you need to change the question. You know? Yeah. So, so if someone says something like, you know, well, I find my soulmate. Well, that's a yes, and that's a kind of like date question and makes all sorts of assumptions. I always want to say, well, what makes you think you're entitled to a soulmate? But that would be rude. So I don't. <laughs> but anyway, but you know, so then you change it to look at issues around relationships and how do you block yourself and, and so forth and so forth. But then it, then it struck me at, you know, well, who am I to do that? It's her questions. Yeah. And that's what she wants to know. And I'm, I'm here to answer her question. That's my purpose as a tarot reader. You know, um, I got this probably from Susan Weed. I don't know if you know who she is. She's an herbalist and a feminist and a really brilliant person. Sounds and, uh, very familiar. I'm so bad with names, though. Yeah, and Susan, you know, I think Mary and I were actually teaching at her center one time. And we, I guess, you know, we were saying this idea that, like, you know, um, you, can't, you can't just answer these, like, out and out psychic questions. You need to go deeper, or, you know, stuff like that. And she says, no, you know, if they want a therapist, they'll go to a therapist. They're coming to you as a tarot reader. You know, your job is to answer their questions. And they're really hitting that. But yeah, I, you know, I really like that. I think it really makes a lot of sense, you know? Yeah. I'm not doing therapy. Uh, it's not my job, you know? Absolutely. Um, I, I'm here totally to answer agree. questions. So I just write down what they say. That actually came out of a reading. Uh, this, this woman came, and it was about her living situation. And she started saying these very precise things, like the, about her landlord and her relationship with him. I just started writing down what she said, because it was so, such vivid statements. And the entire reading was just cards for those statements. So you don't have to worry about formulating questions. You just ask people what they want to know. Very interesting. But typically, those people won't say anything. Oh, I don't know. I just want to see what the cards have to say. Uh, that's the, the most challenging for me is when yeah. they don't have a question because yeah. sometimes they don't understand how t their, their view of the tarot is sort of from what they've seen in movies or, or you I know. know. Yeah. And it's really difficult, but uh, I I do it all the time. But I try to give them a little explanation as to well, this works a little better if you if you produce a question. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when they don't have a question, I will do just a Celtic cross. You know. Yeah. 
that's yeah. really good to know. Yeah. I've had a couple of instances which actually w where people were kind of faking it, you know, uh, and once or twice it actually was to benefit because when the answer came, they believed it. You know, um, <laughs> if they had told me the question, they would have thought I was just being nice, you know. So the great example was this woman, and she was actually a former tarot reader, so I should have been a little bit suspicious that she had something up her sleeve. <laughs> and so she said, no questions. I want to see what the card says. I said, okay. So I put the cards out, and then I feel kind of foolish because it's so specific. I said to her, is there any way you could become pregnant in the next six months? And she said, oh, my God, that's what I came to find out. <laughs> Wow. That's but so if she had said, can I become pregnant? I said, yes, and become pregnant. She wouldn't have believed me. She would have just, I was being nice to her. So the fact that I did it as a magic trick, and, you know, just knocked her out and she believed it, you know? So interesting. Yeah. But still, usually, you know, another, here's another great line from uh, a tarot reader. Um, he said, she has a client, you know, and she said, what are your questions? So, oh, well, uh, aren't you supposed to tell me that? Oh. You know? And she says, um, when she said, her line is, um, I'm a seer, not a mind reader. Right. <laughs> and then someone, else said, then someone else says, you know, um, that they say, well, aren't you supposed to tell me? She says, look, look, you know, when you go to the doctor, you don't wait for the doctor to tell you your symptoms. You tell the doctor your symptoms. Exactly. And the doctor tells you what you need to know. Why would you think a tower reader should not only answer your questions, but actually know your, find out, figure out your questions? So that's your job, you know, to have questions. Exactly. I agree. Oh, that, hap that happens to everyone, I imagine, who, who yeah. Uh, is a reader. Yeah, yeah, you have to deal with that somehow. And sometimes, like I said, sometimes, in, you know, one time I did a reading for this woman, she refused to say anything, would have any expression, just sat there like a stone, you know? So I soldiered through as best as I could, so I Celtic Cross, you know, and I said some stuff. And in the reading, she didn't want, you know, card by card, everything I said was exactly what was happening, you know? Exactly what was going on, that was it, that's what it was. So she was very pleased. She got a good, accurate tarot reading. And my thought was, well, if you had said what you wanted to know, then we could have started from there. Instead yeah. of the whole reading just being revealing what you already know so, to impress you. Yeah. You know, so I just wish, very people, true. I wish people would understand that. That is really valuable if they express what they want to know and the cards can tell them. It's, it's better for them, you know? Absolutely. Totally agree. Yeah, they're so afraid of fake. They're so afraid of being tricked by some charlatan. Well, I know. I mean, that's that's just uh, what we have to deal with because of you know, there are so many people who you know use tarot f uh, for that purpose, or you know, or aren't authentic or meaningful about it. You know what I mean? And I think yeah. that you know that's the important thing is that it's meaningful for people. Yeah. And you know, and, and there are certain cons you can look out for if, if a tarot reader you don't know or a storefront tarot reader. Because well, if you know, they say there's a curse that's been put on you, and they can fix, they can fix it. You know, oh, those kind of I've had that done. That happened to me in Baltimore, and I was, I walked out. I actually, I paid her more money because I was like, if she can put a curse on me, I don't want to. I was like, I just gave her like an extra like ten bucks or something as a tip, yeah. and I just said, I'm not interested, <laughs> and I yeah. walked out. But yeah. I was like, but I don't want her like you know, I don't want to like her have her angry in case she can put a curse on me. <laughs> <laughs> I had a situation actually with someone. I'd had a terrible falling out with someone who, I won't, I won't say things about this person because I shouldn't gossip, but this person was capable of, try, of trying to put a curse on me and not doing it herself, but wanting to. And I knew that she was friends with some, uh, this is difficult to talk about, voodoo practitioners. Yes. And I don't want to buy into cliches of voodoo. I have tremendous respect for voodoo. So I don't want to, but still, she, I could see her going and saying, I want you to put a curse on this person, you know? So I w when I went to a tarot reader at a, at a fair, and she said, well, maybe was he said, uh, well, someone's put a curse on you. I, I gave it some credence, especially because that person did not offer to take away the curse for a vast amount of money, you know? Yeah. And so, well, you know, I, I did some ritual work on my own to alleviate the situation, and that was that, you know? Very interesting. <laughs> That's so yeah. interesting. I need to learn more about that stuff. I, I don't really know too much about, um, I'm getting into it now. I'm sorry. I, I read a book called the, the way of weird, uh, which was mm. very, uh, sort of, it's about like, you know, the old, um, uh, it's Anglo-Saxon sort of, uh, sorcery. Okay. Oh yeah. Um, weird with faith. Yeah. Yes. And it's yeah. very, very interesting. It's got me and I've always been into Celtic stuff, but I'm just, be, I'm becoming more interested in mm -hmm. those types of things. Uh, just as an interest, you know, 
I love voodoo and other Afro-American cultural um, traditions because first of all, they're a living tradition. They're not something ancient. Um, yes. And because, um, you know, the, well, that gods, we, we would call them gods, um, the Orishas and, and others and the Waz are, are, are present. They're yes. not, you know, somewhere distant that we have no connection with them. They're right there. They possess people. Um, I went to a lecture once about divine possession and the uh, teacher um, said this really, really smart thing. He said, um, possession in the world is primarily divine, not demonic. Yeah. The idea of possession is demonic is a, primarily a Western Christian belief. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, which to some extent Jewish, but not as much in Islam also. But in general, in the world, the world's religions, possession is primarily by uh, benign beings, by the, you know, by the gods. There's an interesting deck. Uh, it's called the uh, New Orleans Voodoo Tarot. Have you have you seen that one? It's pretty. I've had deck. it for years and years, and I love it. But I feel like it's too. It's not a. It's, it's hard to get into it because you don't know what what the pictures are showing. Yes, you. I might have lost the book, so I don't. I can't research it. That's what yeah. I felt. The book was the best part of of the deck. I yeah. thought the artwork was also very pretty, um, and it's an older deck, so of course it's not. You know, today you you have all these really beautiful decks on the, you yeah. know, top notch cardstock with yeah. gold gilding, and yeah. they're just so beautiful now. But, but you often uh, can't shuffle them, though. You know. Yeah, that's very true too. Yeah, yeah. a lot of people uh, don't prefer those uh, big yeah. beautiful decks. <laughs> that's also there's true. One, there's a wonderful deck that borrows about. Uh, Haiti is called Vodun. Um, it turns out there's all these different names for different locations, apparently. Anyway, but um, so it's called the Ghetto Tarot, which is in Haiti. The term ghetto doesn't mean what it means here. Yes. It means the place where the people's energy is, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's a wonderful deck. and It's mostly just photographic replications of the uh, rider deck. But because it's borrowing on the energy of that culture, it's actually very powerful. And it's just enough connections to vote them to really give it some life and energy from that. I love that deck. I think I saw that on Kickstarter, and I almost got it. I, I, if I'm not, was it on Kickstarter or was it on uh, maybe I Amazon? So. I believe it was Kickstarter, yeah. And I think it's separately sold out, so it's out of print. And there might have been even a second edition that sold out too. Very yeah. interesting. Oh, I'll have to keep an eye out for that. But and then there's a lot of other decks, um, Tarot of the Orishas and some other decks, Numinous Tarot, that are very strongly African traditions. Yes. But to my way of seeing them, what my experience trying to work with them is that you have to know it all beforehand. Yes. You know, the, the deck will not teach you the stuff you need to know. You have to have a way to know what it's referencing. That's the original sure. Orleans Voodoo Tarot. I felt that way too. Yeah. You're probably right. Yeah, because it's a deck I've never used, but I just enjoyed reading the book and learning about it. Mm -hmm. And I also love New Orleans as a place. It's it's really yeah. one of the most fascinating places I've ever been. So I just never been there. I want to go there. Yeah. Oh, I loved it. It's it's so it's there's so much there, and it's the food is is worth the trip alone. Oh, bad. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. Um, well, speaking of decks, so uh, you know. I have a question from Robin from Toadstool Tower. He wants okay. to know, what did you learn by creating your own deck? And uh, do you encourage encourage others to do the same as sort of a, like a learning experience for I think that deck? you, I think you learn the tarot at, at much deeper levels, you know? You really get into, the tarot is a living thing, but also how it works. So both in a certain sense, the mechanical side and the vibrant living side, you know? Because, but I mean, also it depends how you do it. I mean, most tarot decks are based upon a system, and my tarot deck was based on things that came to me. It was pretty much spontaneous. I see some, yeah. oh, that card, that would make a good, you know, four stones, and I drew, I drew that picture, you know. Yes. So it took four years to do it because I did it that way, yeah. uh, but to me it was a very living kind of thing to do it that way. But at the same time, I also was able to connect it very powerfully to tarot tradition, particularly the writer deck. And the pictures don't look like the writer decks. So a lot of people have trouble with that, but they're very much connected to it. I love your deck. I think the tribes have a dialogue with the writer deck. I definitely see it. I mean, I I really loved your your deck. I really and the book with it is is really really well well done. And uh, I love. The, there's one thing I always wanted to ask you, and I always said, you know, 
if I ever sit down with Rachel Pollock, I will have to ask <laughs> her about um, Persephone and uh, the ah. Eleusinian Mysteries. Yeah, because yeah. I, that sort of sent me, that was the book that sent me down, the, your, your, your deck guide sent me down this okay. little journey yeah. about the yeah. Eleusinian Mysteries. Yeah, yeah. And there wasn't much I could find on it, uh, to be honest. It was with a you. huge it was amount, forced. actually, really. I have to, um, like, you know, it's because um, it, one of the books, see, my approach is a lot of modern books on the subject, they're arguing something. They're arguing yeah. for drugs, they're arguing for this other thing, for like, you know, goddess revival and stuff. And I just wanted to get, I mean, I have very strong opinions about it. I'm, I'm not neutral. Well, I love it yeah. and I want to hear them. But at the same those. time, um, I wanted to get into the stories and the power of them and not have a ready made approach, you know? Sure. Um, so knowing that, um, one book I'd recommend is a pretty deep book. Um, it's called The Lucis. I think that's what the title of it by Carl Karenyi. Carl with a K. Um, and then um, K E R E N Y A. And he was, um, I think he was actually a, um, a Jungian psychologist, also was a, an historian and had great knowledge of Greek religion and mythology. So he has this deep knowledge, but also this deep feeling for it. I just, I love his work, you know. One time on a plane, uh, I had his book on Hermes, and I filled up, you know, a good 200 pages of notes from reading that, you know. <laughs> um, so, but there's so many things you can read, you know. If you can find a book, The Body of the Goddess, that my, my writing, that was my writing about the subject. Oh, I will look for that. I it's didn't hard even to know find, that. unfortunately. Body, yeah. I will get it. Body of the Goddess? Yeah, yeah. That was uh, one of my an favorite anyway. works. And I'm hoping that maybe it, it can be come back in print with some revisions. But uh, and that that would be great. As I, 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 and I didn't even realize it until the end. But Persephone was like the hero of the deck, and I didn't quite understand that until I got to the end. And, and the book I'm doing now, which is by the, by, that was I call my memoir, um, and certainly in the beginning section is a lot about Persephone and Demeter. So what is your connection with that? Like when the, the, the cause I've, you, you mentioned that in every one of your books, uh, stories yeah. about Persephone. So you obviously adore her, uh, yeah. or at least the story, you know, in Demeter. Yeah. And I just was wondering, you know, what, what in that, you know, what was the relation? What was your fascination with, with it? I think it was just, you know, certain, I mean, I had this very short relationship with the Greeks, you know, the Greek gods and goddesses. It's very yes. personal. It's the ones, they're so vivid, you know, they're, they're more like characters. Like some friends of mine who are deeply into Egypt and stuff, they say, well, we know the Greeks are so, you know, they're like problems and they're argumentative and so on. And, and the Egyptians really have much more depth. And I, I kind of see that, but the Greeks are to me like more alive somehow. It's just, there's nothing, no reflection on anybody else's attachments, purely me, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, so Persephone, Hermes, um, Athena, I have very personal relationships with them. Artemis, very, very strongly so. Um, so to me, it's, all, it's something I'm drawn to for a long time, you know. Very interesting. One time someone told me about a, a conference that was going to be held about Athena in Europe. Um, and my immediate response was totally unthinking. I just said, oh, I'd love to go to that. Athena's a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I refer to Hermes as my brother. But Persephone is my hero, you know, and, and Demeter, very much her mother. You know, I mean, I see it a very feminist kind of way in the sense that Demeter sure. is the woman who doesn't give in. You know, yes. the gods all tell her, you just have to accept this, you know. Death is a good husband. It's done. It's finished. Your daughter's now there. She's not coming back. And she just stops the world. She will let anything grow. And doesn't even do it consciously. She does it. She's in such grief that nothing grows, and because she doesn't just give in, they have to give in to her and let her daughter come back. It's such a powerful story, you know. Yeah. And meanwhile, Persephone has been transformed, and we don't know what happens in the land of the dead, but she's transformed. Before that, she's just called Cory, which means daughter. She has no name, but when she comes back, she's she who shines in the dark, which is what Persephone means, and she becomes the light of the dead souls. So you wonder, like, how did this happen? How did she, you know, gain that power? It's a mystery, you know, and the mysteries are all about that, the great mysteries. Yes. That's really fascinating. I, I always enjoy reading about her uh, in your books. Yeah. And uh, I did notice that people, sometimes people will wear um, 
like pomegranates or you'll see like pomegranate yeah. things. And I also saw there was a, a parallel with, uh, uh, with, uh, what is it? Uh, Rosh Hashanah with, with pomegranates. Um, yeah. Well, pomegranates have a long Jewish tradition. In fact, the high priestess, um, in the writer dag, I'm writing a whole big thing about this in this new book. Um, kind of brings together the Shekinah, the, you know, the female aspect of God in Judaism, and Persephone, because pomegranates both figure very prominently in those yes. traditions. In, in Judaism, mystical Judaism, paradise, the Garden of Eden, Gan Eden, as it's called in Hebrew, is not, it's, it's like in, in the past, you know, but um, the paradise that the mystics try to go to and, and sometimes do is called the Orchard of Pomegranates, uh, Pardes Rimanim. And, you know, pomegranates are so powerful because they have endless, you can't even count how many seeds they have. They have life-giving properties. Um, they look like blood, the juice. At the same time, though, it um, revives the sick. You know, they have a lot of free radicals, which, or rather, they have a lot of stuff to fight off the free radicals, which cause cancer. Um, they have estrogen, so they have female energy. Pomegranates are very powerful things. So it's no wonder that they became significant in these two great sure. traditions, you know, Greek and Hebrew. It's very interesting. Well, because of your uh, love for um, storytelling, I actually just received this today. And I don't, do you have this or have you seen this, the Tarot of the Divine? I just got it yesterday. Oh, you did get it. Isn't oh. that great? It but is. It's really, it's really, really great. It's so much fun. You know, the pictures are like a, like a children's book of world fairy tales. Yeah, yeah it's not like quality, which I love. They're beautiful, the pictures. But I, there's a big problem for me with it. It doesn't tell you what the stories are about. It just gives you the name of the character and the culture. Interesting. You know, there should be like at least a couple of sentences of what happens in that story so you can connect to that. Sure. And maybe on the website there is. I'll have to go check and see. If I haven't really website. looked through it yet, but I thought of you. I was like, you know, this is this would be right up Rachel's alley because oh, it's it all is. about I stories. It. And yeah, the art is and beautiful. Good How about stories. The it's a great variety, you know, all over the world, you know. Yeah, and the card quality is so nice, yeah. too. It's got, a, like, a nice, beautiful linen finish. Yeah, I know. The linen finish is nice, yeah. And uh, they just feel so nice, so I just, was like, really love them. But, but you, know, you uh, can't shuffle decks that thick. So I, I was thinking one way you could shuffle, I guess, is you break it into two or three parts and shuffle those. You know? Yeah, that's you true. you push everything around. It's just, you get around that, but it's nice to be able to shuffle it in traditional ways. Sure. I have big monster hands, so I think um, – I am, uh, you know, used to shuffling very large decks. Well, I have so. big hands too. It's it's not the size, it's not the dimensions. It's the thickness of the deck. Right. Because the, the best shuffling is the riffle shuffle. Where you you know, like you use your thumbs and you yes. Them together, oh, you're a riffle you riffle can, shuffler. And, yeah, and you can't do that with decks that thick. This true. Is gonna happen. That's very true. You know? Yeah, that yeah. means I never riffle shuffle. I very rarely I, I riffle okay. shuffle with decks of cards. Uh, if I'm doing like playing card reading or something like that, I will. I will definitely um, riffle yeah. shuffle or yeah. smaller decks. Uh, the the big disappointment that I have uh, the one deck is the Lay Tower Noir. Have you ever heard of that uh, deck? Again? The Lay Tower Noir. No, let me see it. It's, it's uh, uh, yes, I do. Let me just pull it out. So this is the big black box. Uh, it's a French deck. Oh, I see it. I think, but I haven't read it. I haven't. Uh, don't have it. Well, the book is. I the book is all in uh, French. Okay. Uh, so the book does me no good, yeah. but the, the cards themselves are really, really beautiful. Probably my favorite Marseille deck. It's definitely a Marseille it's style. Like, okay. Well, then that's, you just use your knowledge of that. Show you like these, but the, well, that's, that's interesting. Actually, you know, this looks very Carrington. Let me see some others. Yes. And then you have the emperor here. Okay. That's more. Yeah. That's a little bit less Leonore Carrington. Yeah. It's definitely a surrealist style. It's, I think it's influenced by Leonore Carrington. I, this is my favorite. I saw the reason I got this is I was watching a YouTube video. This is lovely, I like this a lot. Yeah, is and available? I, is it available? still for sale somewhere? Well, yeah, you have to go on Amazon.fr, oh, okay. and um, I will try and find you a copy because oh, I was I was going that, yeah. to I was going to give you the Tarot of the Divine, and I was like, oh, she has it already, <laughs> so it's, it's sort of awkward. But I well, will find I would, you I a would copy. Love that. Thank you so I will much. find yeah. you a copy of this, and I will send it to you, um, and I'll email you for the for the for the information. But okay. I really love it. But the only thing is, 
it's very, very big and hard to shuffle. You may be able to riffle shuffle them, but they're just big. And that was the yeah. only disappointment about the deck is that it's 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 big. But you know, yeah. you may be able to shuffle it. I don't know. I I don't really have too much trouble. I just wish they were a little smaller and yeah. they would come out with. Uh, but let me just show you the whole deck, just so. Yeah. And they are gold gilded. Yeah. But uh, the they're wide. Thing is hard to shuffle too. Yes, but you could shuffle it long ways, sort of like this. Yeah. You know what I mean? And but that's what I come, do. They go in, but they go in clumps. You see when you do that. Yes, that's true. So you, but you could so, probably yeah. riffle shuffle. Let me see. I don't you know. You have to just do it mud cake style. You know what yeah, that this is, is right? but put them on the table, just spread them all around. Oh, that's true. Hands, yes, you know? I yeah. do that with some decks. Yeah. Um, but this is like you know one of my favorite decks. But it's obviously that's what everybody's uh, problem is with it is that it's not really shuffleable. But it's more of a work of art, and I just like to yeah. have it, and I just play with the cards whenever I want to look at the the really pretty art. It's it's one of it's my favorites. Like, at least the very first card you showed is very like Carrington. Um, yeah. Did you want to see some more? Let me just see. see a couple more. I want to see if that follows through some of the other cards. So we have the death card here. Yeah, see, that's, I mean, uh, uh, maybe some other surrealist painters, that, but that definitely reminds me of Leonora Carrington. Here is Justice. Yeah, it really, you know, it, it is interesting, actually. The, they're very different in the details, but the style of the faces. and I love it. I think it's so it's beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, let me see one more. Temperance. Here's Temperance. Oh, Speaking gorgeous. of. I love the way the color blends into the earth. No, it's, it's gorgeous. I really like it a lot. I will I find you it. a copy of it because it's uh, mm -hmm. it is available on Amazon uh, .fr. So, um, okay. but uh, I will definitely do that for you. And I Wonderful. really appreciate you coming on today, Rachel. It's it's been yeah, it's really been an great. honor for me. A lot. Well, thank you so much. And yeah. uh, I just really really appreciate. It. Is there anything you'd you'd like to talk about uh, as far as an upcoming things or anything, any announcements or anything no, you want to um, make? Nothing immediate. You know, I'm waiting for the. Um, because the Skull Tower to come out. Go ahead, yes. the deck consent, don't have it yet. But well, also the stuff I'm doing tends to be more long range, so I don't have anything immediate you know, coming out. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to taking a class with you because that, okay. I've, I see that your classes fill up so quickly, and I've always just been trying to follow it along. But okay. obviously there's a reason that your classes fill, fill up quickly. <laughs> well. You're one of the best teachers probably ever. Um, but. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I will definitely keep an eye out um, okay. for that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we've been talking about it. I've just been so busy with stuff, and other people ask me to do classes. I, I've not gotten down to arranging the next one, but I know we want to do it. So. Well, it's so hard with COVID-19, too. I mean, now, you know, with, with all well, the COVID see, stuff. Well, see, people True. far away can take the class, actually. I guess it depends on, yes, it depends on your perspective. I mean, I don't like it. I much prefer to teach in person. Yes, but that's it, true. But, you know, it's worked out when I've done it, and, and it does allow for – many more people to have access you know from all yeah. over the place i'm taking a runes class right well it's not it's actually a casting class with uh with kelly from the truth and story and it's really okay. it's we we did week one it's a four-week class but uh it's all on zoom and it's 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 perfectly fine i mean it's yeah it's it's really you know yeah. it's it's this almost it's almost like being there not quite but yeah almost yeah. you know yeah but it's amazing Luckily, we have Zoom and things like that that we can still do the things we love to do um, in a, in a in a way, in a way you know yeah not, yeah not, know. A, not yeah. the same but sort of not the same yeah 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 I have to laugh because you have a bookshelf small bookshelf behind you and so I've been watching these uh, these things on TV like you know on some of the cable channels of discussing politics and stuff and everyone has of course their little their room with the Zoom you know. Yes, and just about every single person has bookcases behind them. Oh. It's like someone said, you know, someone said you want to have bookcases behind you to show you're learned, to show you're smart. That's yeah. funny, actually. These are Stephen's books, uh, really? except for the astrology book, but he's got uh -huh. stuff on friends and tennis, tennis for dummies. I just put your uh -huh. books up there just to kind of set the stage. But uh, my books are scattered. I have a bookshelf over here, which is all my tarot books and my sort of, uh, you know, my mythology books, my Jungian yeah, books, nice. stuff yeah. like that, and. And then I have my tarot shelf over here. Uh, the place is a mess, but uh, I'll turn it around. <laughs> okay. So that's my tarot collection there. I don't oh, know nice. if you can yeah. see it. That's yeah, my tarot yeah, collection. Yeah. So I have all my Marseille decks up top, and then I have the Rider Waite Smith on the right. And now, is everything have, always um, organized and this neat? No, Stephen is a very <laughs> neat person. I'm, okay. <laughs> I'm the slob. And then that's my little bookshelf there with my cat sleeping but i sort of oh, move things out of the way but, oh. yeah oh i have three of them she's she's the youngest one she sort of just showed up one day uh -huh. um i have i i rescued one on i don't know if you're familiar with philadelphia but on 10th and spring garden which is like sort of 
like the busiest like downtown area of Philadelphia. And here's this little kitten sort of strolling along. So I, I got the one from there. Uh, the, our second cat was like born in a home. So we, I adopted her when my, when my oldest cat passed uh-huh. away. And then she, I, we were only planning to have two cats, but one day she showed up outside and uh, I just, I couldn't turn her away. So it was yeah. meant to be though, because actually yeah. she made life a lot easier because the middle cat was torturing the older cat and oh, she wanted to play all the time, you know, and there was an age difference. So, yeah. so getting a second kitten was definitely, um, you know, helpful. You know what I mean? Yep. So save, right. save the older cat more good. aggravation. So. Yeah, good. Well, this is a great justice. I really, I really enjoyed this. Yes, I thank you so much, Rachel, for doing this. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. And uh, stay in touch. And you're welcome okay. to come on anytime you like. Uh, okay, great. You know, you yeah. Just let me know, and okay. I will love to do this again with you. So, okay. thank you so much. Thank you. Be well. Thank you. Really Best to time. you, you and everyone. Okay. Thank you, Justin. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.